Anna attends a preschool down closer to where we live in Gaithersburg, and overall, we have a very positive um, impression of them, a very positive sense of what they're doing for her, the ways that she's kind of growing into herself. But there are a couple of experiences over this last week that have left me a little bit befused and bemused and befuddled. Several days ago, um, I think it was right at the very beginning of the week, one of her teachers pulled me aside when I showed up to pick her up, and she said, you know, she loves when we play outside, getting in the dirt and the muck and getting all kind of uh, into the soil and getting dirty. And some parents are really kind of on the fence about that and others aren't, and I just wanted to check with you and see how you feel about it. And I said, kids are kids. Let her get dirty. There's a reason we have baths and showers. <laughs> but this was even further brought home yesterday when I took Anna to their Earth Day celebration at her school. One of the kind of hallmarks of the day and the big sort of culminating event was that the kids and the parents together participated in planting some new plants that they have developed in a kind of bed, garden bed, raised garden bed there at the school. So Anna and I went through and we selected a basil plant that she wanted to plant and we found our little patch of soil and she and I rolled up our sleeves and we just started digging in and kind of pulling up the soil so that we could plant this basil plant. And remember, this was an Earth Day celebration. One of the teachers frantically ran over to give us disposable latex gloves so that our hands wouldn't get dirty. And I said, we're okay. There's a reason why soap and water exist. We can go clean up afterwards. But it really brought home to me a point that we hear in our readings today that I want to spend some time focusing on. And this particular day and age in our society at large, I dare say that we have an obsession with this kind of lily-white, sanitized version of the world. That we want everything to fit together neatly in these ways that make sense to us, in these categories that feel comfortable that make us feel good about ourselves and the world around us. But in truth, if we dig a bit below the surface on today's readings, if we get our own hands dirty in the rich soil of Scripture, one of the fundamental points we hear today is that that kind of reality is not the truth of either the world or the truth of God's kingdom as it ever more manifests in the world. So let's think about that a little bit today. The messiness, the complications, the complexities, and what that means for us in this time, and how we might be called more fully to follow Christ in the reality of the work that he is doing. One element of this is the question of who abides in love or who is the true vine of Christ. The sort of parallel structures that we hear both in the Gospel of John and in our epistle from 1 John. So if we look at 1 John chapter 4, we hear two things in particular that I want to note for us this morning. In verse 7, we hear, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
And then a little bit further down in verse 15, we hear God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. And then as sort of a complementary element of that, in our gospel from St. John, we hear in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Those who abide in me bear much fruit. So, if we pay attention there, there's no conditionality on any of those statements. It is not those who love in this prescribed way that we set out are the ones whose love is from God. Or that those who abide in Christ only in the ways that we expect them to abide in Christ bear much fruit. No, it's those who love and those who abide. And if we're being honest about that, the reality that I think probably every single one of us has encountered at some point in our lives is that we eventually get brought up short in recognizing that truth of God's reign and God's work in this world. Because no matter how often we try to stay open-minded, we inevitably, in our human conditions, get stuck in these places of wanting our way to be the way, our truth to be the truth, our definition of all of these things to be the definition. And yet, if we pay close attention to the world around us, very often we find that God's work is far more expansive than our categories and conditionalities. That no matter how much we want the world to work in our image, in our prescribed ways of doing things, it doesn't. There's a diversity. There's an expansive diversity that ultimately undercuts and challenges that limitation. And so, in one sense, our readings today are to be, are encourage us to be more alert to and aware of those places of complexity and messiness that don't fit our neat little categories that we want them to. And to be alert to the fact that the Spirit moves in just such a way more often than not in the world around us. Those who abide and those who love are not for us to judge, but instead for us to witness to, to be observant of, to listen with a keen ear, so that the work of the Spirit in the world around us may be ever clearer to our own perceptions, so that we may be observed, so that we may observe and be surprised by the work of grace that Christ abounds in every moment of every day. And this particularly is evident in this story of Philip and the eunuch. Philip is called by the Spirit to go on to this road, not certain of what he's going to find, not certain of the experience that lies ahead of him, but he simply listens and responds in that listening to the journey and to the opportunity to be surprised by grace. And he encounters this eunuch, and this is such a fascinating element of the narrative. Now, we hear in our Acts reading today that this eunuch was a court official of the Queen of Ethiopia, but eunuchs, in a general sense, 
within the Greco-Roman world and in classical antiquity were kind of a complicated, messy, as it were, uncategorized people. They were a people that didn't fit clear distinctions and clear categories. In a very sort of strict and regimented sense from the first century Jewish perspective and likely from the perspective of the first Christian communities developing themselves and kind of getting their feet under them in this time after the ascension, they would have been considered ritually impure and unclean people. People that in their very essence have this kind of fundamental corruption within them. And I think that many of us can envision or conceive of categories of people in our own day and time that we might classify in that category. Either unreflective in our own life or categories that we can see at society at large placing people within that bucket as well. And yet, that status does not prevent the work of the Spirit from manifesting. This court official, this eunuch, is working through Scripture trying to understand it more fully. And Philip takes this opportunity to enlighten him. And in so doing, this act of transformative grace occurs. And what's so very noticeable about that is that there was no conditionality on it. Philip does not say, yes, you can be baptized, but only after a certain period of instruction, only after you go home and reform X, Y, and Z parts of your life. No, that extension of God's love, that response to the work of the Spirit in the immediacy of the moment is done without any precondition. It is done purely out of an act of loving one another and witnessing and responding to the presence of the Spirit in that interaction. It's ultimately being surprised by grace, but not just being surprised by grace, being responsive to the ways that grace surprises us. So in this season, rife with agricultural metaphors, I invite us today to think about the messiness that we are called into, the ways we are called to get our own hands dirty, to be surprised by grace and to get out of our dichotomies and discover the greater organic work of truth that Christ is manifesting in the world around us. And we might each think of some examples of that in our lives, but I want to offer one in particular that struck me during our Lenten season. Some of you may have encountered what I see as a major dichotomy just within our own tradition at some points in the past, maybe even in some ways still presently. And that is this dichotomy between kind of a overly heavy-handed sense of um, concern for our own unworthiness, our own dirtiness, our own lack of cleanliness. I think in this instance of a church, we'll go unnamed, in which I was presiding for the very first time several years ago, and afterwards was gently accosted by one of the members who expressed very significant concern that I had omitted the prayer of humble access from the service, as if having omitted the prayer of humble access, I had fundamentally undercut the power of what it was that we were doing in the Eucharist. As we explored and talked about it more, the concern was that we are fundamentally unworthy people and there is nothing of goodness within us that only 
the only goodness, the only pure thing in this world is God, and we need to be ever mindful of our own shortcomings in the face of God. And I have to admit that interaction left me feeling less than good. But the challenge there, I think, too, in responding to that, is not to swing in a dramatic sort of pendulum arc in the opposite direction. In seminary, I was in a class one time where we read a poem, and I don't remember the exact context or content of the poem, but the overarching theme of it was that God always says yes to us. That whatever our conditions, whatever our challenges, whatever our issues, God is always saying yes. And I remember going to the professor afterwards and saying, this also <laughs> doesn't make me feel good. Isn't there some way, some middle ground between this kind of extreme unworthiness element on the one hand, this kind of puritanical purity culture that no one can ever live up to, and saying, well, on the other hand, everything is good, we're all good, nothing is in need of any work. Isn't there something of gospel truth in between those two things? And that was brought to mind for me in Lent, because during Holy Week, when the clergy from around the diocese gathered to renew our vows, we had a brief period of renewal and kind of reflection, a sort of mini-retreat, as it were, the morning of that service. And Bishop Gene Robinson, the former bishop of New Hampshire, led that retreat, and he reflected on an element of prayer book revision in the 1970s, which he had lived through as a young clergyman. And he said that during that period, there had been a trial ordination rite that used the very ancient orthodox phrase throughout the service in which the bishop would stand before the congregation. I apologize, this was before women's ordination, so it was exclusively men. But the bishop would stand before the congregation and say, is he worthy? And the congregation would reply, he is worthy. Axios, axios. It's the, the phrase in the orthodox tradition that is used to communicate that worthiness. And Bishop, Bishop Robinson said, you know, contextually this would make sense in a certain way, but in our context, in our society, the ways that we think about this, that doesn't make me feel good. Who are we to say that we are worthy? We aren't. We all, all come up short at times in our lives. And yet, the greater truth is not to wallow in that shortcoming, but to recognize that we are fundamentally made worthy by what Christ has done for us. That we ourselves are not the worthy party, but that we are made worthy through Christ. It is that abidingness, the way in which love permeates us in the fullness of our being. And if we look at the full arc, then, of what we hear in our scripture lessons today, that is the truth of what we hear. Because if we look back, then, at that section of St. John's Gospel, and we do hear, you have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you, that's verse 3, but immediately preceding that, we hear, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. And in 1 John, we hear those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. It is not just about love. It is not just about abiding. But it is the way in which that 
love, that abiding, transforms us into new life, into new growth, into a new season of rich soil tending and the explosive, expansive flowering and fruitfulness of that attentiveness brings forth. So today, friends, as we move into this season of agricultural metaphors, as we prepare next week together, actually in a vineyard, in order to celebrate this particular season of our life together, I invite us to get messy, to get our hands into the soil of Scripture, to recognize both the places in which we attempt and strive and seek to love and abide, the places in which we work to cultivate that connection of spirit, but also to be mindful of those places of shortcoming, those places in which we are caught off guard, surprised by grace, and alerted to the work of the spirit beyond our constraints, so that we may be ever more fully present to the work that God is doing around us, and that we may be ever more connected to the work that is being called forth in and out of us. May we, we, may we be nourished, may we be transformed, and may we bear the good fruit of the vine of which we are a part. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.